It's a pleasure to be here at the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting uh, speaking to you today about glaucoma and uh, about the management of our challenging glaucoma patients and about where transcleral cyclophotocoagulation uh, with the G-probe fits in. Um, I think it's a great moment to just take some time and look around here at the uh, convention hall and to think about what's new in glaucoma and where glaucoma is headed. Uh, the reason is because uh, you'll hear people talk about uh, new surgical options in the field of glaucoma. There's a lot of talk about cataract surgery, things that can be done at the same time of cataract surgery. The ideas that are coming up though are micro-incisional, limiting the number of incisions, preserving future options, getting patients on fewer medications. Uh, and as you'll see, there are also some options we've had for quite a while that do many of the same things. Um, I'm going to uh, be focusing on the uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, which is uh, done with the 810 nanometer diode laser. It's uh, several different models uh, from Uridex allow this the Oculite SLX system or the uh, IQ810. Uh, the G probe is the handpiece that delivers the uh, laser energy and, and targets it towards the ciliary body. And the underlying process is that it reduces aqueous humor formation uh, by uh, coagulating proteins uh, in the ciliary body and processes. Uh, we, we have a lot of outflow procedures that can be performed in glaucoma and very few procedures that target the other side of the equation, reducing aqueous humor formation. Uh, tra uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation is titratable and it's repeatable. I'll show you a little data on that. And uh, you know, it's non-incisional and it can be uh, delivered several different ways. It can be delivered uh, in the operating room or in the office and uh, with a number of different types of anesthesia. I think retrobulbar block, uh, whether again it's in the office or in an outpatient setting is probably uh, the most commonly performed way, but some uh, practitioners have had success with parabulbar blocks. Looking at the indications, well, we know many of the traditional indications failed filtering surgery, high pressure despite uh, maximum tolerated medications, patients who have too much scarring to do any type of incisional surgery, um, uh, and then there are the patients with high pressures uh, where the visual potential um, is not quite as good. Uh, my practice, for better or for worse, uh, is filled with patients who've undergone uh, keratoprosthesis. And uh, keratoprosthesis is an artificial uh, replacement of the cornea. And uh, post-keratoplasty or post-keratoprosthesis glaucoma is highly prevalent. These eyes uh, have very limited options. There's not even a lot of areas around the eye to make incisions. Uh, and this is a profoundly valuable treatment for those patients. Uh, and then there are some of the other familiar ones, neovascular glaucoma, isosilicone oil. Um, but there are other populations of patients as well. Uh, some patients who um, may just be limited in their ability to get into the sterile environment of the operating room. So some patients with mobility problems. Uh, patients, um, I have some patients in my practice who have no-showed in the operating room on several occasions. And this is something I can do in my office uh, without costing the healthcare system the $10,000 or whatever it costs to have an operating room that's not being used for an hour. Uh, and then there are other patients who have an unwillingness to go to the operating room, uh, who are scared of uh, incisional procedures. And again, this is something that can be done in, in the outpatient setting. Um, and that opens a lot of doors for patients. photomicrograph of a uh, ciliary process that's been treated uh, with transcleral uh, cyclophotocoagulation. And I would just note um, that you're not destroying the entire uh, ciliary process, um, but just uh, there's a treatment applied uh, generally to the central zone, and there's sparing of the anterior and posterior processes. Uh, and here's a picture of the G-probe. It's a 600 micron diameter quartz fiber that delivers the uh, laser. Uh, 
about 1.2 uh, or maybe a little more millimeters posterior to the limbus is uh, where this probe allows you to align and deliver the energy, which will ensure treatment uh, to the ciliary body. Um, it has a little button on the tip that protrudes and that uh, can indent a conjunctiva and let you see where your last treatment was placed so that you can move over. Um, I think that it's important to think about the contraindications and really if you have an eye with just absolutely uh, zipped close angles um, and very very high pressures you might have difficulty titrating uh, the right amount of laser to reduce the pressure without o going overboard so uh, other than that there's no amount of surgery that can be done that will make it impossible to do this laser afterwards. Uh, and it can be done on eyes that have never had surgery. So it, there's versatility uh, with this treatment um, and very few contraindications. Uh, when I'm discussing what the patients can expect from this procedure, I remind them that, uh, of course, even though it's non-incisional, there can be pain associated with the deliver of the energy. Uh, inflammation inside of the eye uh, certainly can occur. Um, there are a variety of ways to approach this. Uh, for me, a, a potent topical steroid such as Durazol uh, is, is certainly uh, my first choice. Pred for it as well. And uh, occasionally you have an eye that's so inflamed coming in that you might decide to give uh, some sort of periocular steroid treatment uh, you know, in the OR at the same time, uh, but usually not necessary. Um, titratable, repeatable. Um, so if it's repeatable, that means you want to let the patient know, I may take several steps to do this. And uh, I, that for me is a conversation. If I have a patient who's willing to go back to the OR, I'll approach it differently than I will for a patient who says, look, I'm giving you one chance. And m about half my patients tell me this, you know, we need to get this done. Um, and I can't promise that, but I can modify uh, how aggressively I approach the treatment based on the patient's expectations. Um, and I'll show you the literature and reports of hypotony or tysis bulbi. Uh, and as you'll see, there's, of course, uh, patient selection issues in many of the data that we have, but those are certainly risks you don't want to shy away from explaining to your patient. Uh, and the benefits, as I've said, no incision can be performed urgently and again if you have this in your office it sort of gives you uh, an option for patients who come in uh, really in a lot of trouble rapid onset so with pressure reductions uh, that you can see sometimes within the first day uh, and that's really important you know I do a lot of Barvelt uh, tube shunt surgery and I've had a lot of patient lose vision in the seven weeks waiting for their Barvelt to open the Ahmed's great, that works quickly, but then long term, sometimes the Ahmed valve, uh, as I'll show you some data, is a little lacking. So, um, this is just a survey that was performed in the UK. Uh, they looked at a mixture of glaucoma specialists and comprehensive ophthalmologists, and a little over a third of them are using transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, they looked at their settings, and as you'll see, uh, the pretty typical 20 25 applications. Uh, they use transillumination to help see where the ciliary processes are because in some cases you're going to want to move the G-probe back a little bit, I find usually, uh, just to make sure you're treating the area you want. Um, and then again, there's uh, different types of anesthesia. And I found it interesting that a lot of them uh, combined uh, this with cataract extraction. Uh, and that's, again, so I think speaks a little bit to the versatility. So. If you have a patient who's going to get a cataract out, maybe they'll get some pressure reduction from that. Maybe this would be a situation where you do a little bit of light transcleral cyclophotocoagulation just to try to enhance the IOP lowering you may get from cataract surgery. Uh, it, it's an option. Um, American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, issued a position pa paper on cyclophotocoagulation. And again, many of the indications I've already said, uh, including patients who just don't want incisional surgery and then emergent situations. Uh, and they thought that uh, diode transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, which is what you're getting with the G-probe, appears to deliver the best combination of effectiveness, uh, portability, uh, expense, ease of use. And that's, you know, in comparison to things like cryotherapy. Uh, and other options. Uh, generally, this procedure is not very uh, highly user uh, dependent. 
Um, so I'll go over it, but in the background we're all thinking that this is a pretty easy procedure to perform and there's, there's something to be said for that. Uh, you make sure your laser is working and they make sure the G-probe tip is clean. Uh, of course you can avoid that if you're using a fresh G-probe, which is uh, the indication and the recommendation uh, is to use a, a new G-probe each time. Uh, there are reports in literature of the re-sterilization, contamination, um, issues that uh, can lead to things like conjunctival burns, but at the same time many will reuse the G-probe. Uh, anesthesia, um, as, as has been discussed, uh, put a speculum in the eye. Uh, you don't actually have to. Uh, Doug Gasterlin has shown that he's able to just retract the lid either with his hand or he actually uses the G-probe to do that. Uh, usually applying laser to three quadrants, seven applications per quadrant, so that gets me to about 21 on average. Uh, and you could leave the temporal quadrant uh, untreated and use the G-probe to guide the spacing. Some images just showing the placement on the eye. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with uh, how this is done. Uh, again, showing sparing of the temporal quadrant here. This is sort of a uh, ab interno, uh, posterior to anterior uh, view of the eye. Uh, and again, just documenting how much area the G-probe takes up uh, when it's applied to the eye and what it would look like if you mapped out all your treatments. Several different approaches to applying the laser. Uh, there's a slow coagulation technique and then the original technique and Doug Gasterlin, of course, has been an advocate for this technique. Uh, he does adjust the energy a little bit based on the color of the iris because you're going to have more pigment and brown irises uh, and brown ciliary bodies. Um, and you'll, you can use a little less energy. Longer duration, lower energy, so four, four to four and a half seconds, 1.25 watts, uh, and you can deliver less um, or a good amount of energy, but avoid the pops, avoid the destruction, and uh, have this ideally be a less destructive but uh, also still effective therapy. Uh, reduce the amount of inflammation as well. Uh, and, and I have to say, I use I still use uh, the original technique occasionally, more often on retreatments, uh, but for my primary uh, treatment with this, I do use the slow coagulation technique. Um, so these are some of the eyes that traditionally would have been uh, treated. This is someone who's had a tube, neovascular glaucoma, pressure's still high. Uh, I'll show you some data what happens if you put a second tube in an eye like that. Uh, you know, and remember that tube shunts uh, can run into all sorts of problems and, you know, you've put this huge piece of hardware in the eye and then it gets clogged with vitreous and uh, it was a waste of a trip to the OR. Um, here's a short-term uh, complication for an omid valve that was a uh, fibrin clot in the tube. You know, and here's the type of eye you look at and you say, how am I even going to do surgery on this eye? We've got, that's silicone oil. It's like a... Uh, pseudo-hypopion up there from uh, emulsified silicone oil superiorly. They've got the inferior iridectomy. Um, this is a no-brainer in my mind for uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. And also we're keeping in mind this patient's probably had a retinal detachment if they've got silicone oil in their eye. Uh, here was a patient with silicone oil in the eye and someone had the idea of putting a tube in there and the silicone oil uh, actually is occluding the tube lumen there. Um, and so that, that can create a host of problems. Uh, you can put the tubes inferiorly, but again, in my experience, these eyes have a lot of silicone oil migrating all over the place, so that's not a guarantee. And as I said, the keratoprosthesis patients have had good success. Um, I, I want to take a minute and talk about uh, some of the other options. And, and the reason for this is because you'll hear, you know, oh, you know, patients can get uh, what? Cystoid macular edema, something you can get from uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, uh, complications, and I, I feel that when we look at all the other options, we're seeing complications too. And I just want to, you know, as well as we can, sort of have an honest assessment of what type of complications we're getting uh, from our other procedures. So this is the five-year data from the two versus TRAV study. I'll go back to that slide in, in just one minute. but. Uh, 212 eyes, randomized to two versus trabeculectomy. At five years, the pressure was reduced uh, about 50%. Pretty good efficacy. They had a 15% hypotony group in the trabeculectomy. 
Uh, they did reduce the medication use in both groups, but at five years, half the TRABs were failed in 30% of the tubes. What was your likelihood of having a two-line reduction in visual acuity in the tube versus TRAB study? In both groups, about 40%. So let me consent a trabeculectomy patient according to the TUBE versus TRAB study. You have a 50% likelihood of your TRAB working at five years. You may get good pressure reduction. We may go overboard with hypotony and a 40% likelihood of reduction in visual acuity. Now, when I discuss this with my colleagues, they say, well, not my trabeculectomy. I tend not to take that approach. I tend to own up to the largest randomized stu uh, studies and say, this is what we think the surgery does. Uh, the Singapore uh, 5-FU study, again, looked at trabeculectomy, again, found 50% likelihood of failure at five years, but there were more patients who needed a, tra a cataract surgery after the TRAB than there were patients who had their IOP controlled. So now you've booked them really for two surgeries, their trabeculectomy, and then in five years, their cataract extraction. Um, and this is just a survival curve of patients after a TRAB who went on to need cataract surgery, and then after their cataract surgery, uh, six times, uh, within six months, if you had a cataract surgery, you had three times the likelihood of having your TRAB fail. So you're kind of getting patients into this whole sequence of surgeries when you go down the trabeculectomy pathway. And then you've got blebs, and I just love to show pictures of ugly blebs, so I'm gonna take the opportunity. You know, This is a patient who's gonna have two things, bleb dysthesia, because they've got this focal bleb that's going to irritate their eye, and they're going to have a bleb leak. You can see that 10 nylon right through that, you know, one micron thick wall of tissue that's preventing them from endophthalmitis. Here's a patient uh, with a bleb leak. Here I'm doing some fluorescein testing. You know, that's a 1% per year risk with trabeculectomy. Um, so I've shown you some of the other data. Let's look at uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation data. Uh, this is a retrospective study, 74 eyes followed for a year after, 43% IOP reduction. Uh, so that's in the range of tube versus trap. Uh, almost 60% of them were able to reduce the number of drops they were taking, and visual acuity was preserved in the subgroups with good vision. Uh, and then 13% of patients lost some vision due to cataract and glaucoma progression. So again, Okay, yes, you can absolutely lose vision with this procedure, but your options also include other risks to central vision as well. Uh, and in this series, there were no cases of hypotony or tysis, although they have certainly been described. Uh, you know, and the issue there is the patients you choose to do the procedure on. Uh, in, in the studies, and Jeff Kammer has data that I, I won't be presenting, but in patients with good eyes, uh, good vision, uh, the outcomes are probably better than if you take a bunch of patients who've had central retinal vein occlusions and neovascular glaucoma, as those, their pretest probability of central vision loss was already exceptionally high. Uh, here's another study, 92 patients uh, had transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, one eye each. So they did the therapy on one eye and uh, the other eye was uh, monitored. Uh, and uh, this is an international study. Um, again, about half of patients had a pressure drop of 20% or more, which is a standard uh, measure of success. Uh, final IOP was 22 millimeters of mercury or less in, again, about half the eyes. And there was some reduction uh, in visual acuity uh, in this group, uh, but in the fellow eye that was serving in this study as a control, uh, there's a similar amount of uh, visual acuity reduction. So that, again, may be more related to the nature of the eyes, uh, how much damage they had coming in, uh, and not so much uh, something that's being um, introduced by the uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Again, just to show you uh, a different population of eyes, prospective study, 100 eyes, uh, followed for a year, 75% got their pressure to a target range between 5 and 21, no tysis bulbi or hypotony, uh, in this population. And again, just looking at the eyes that, that are brought in here, you've got neovascular eyes, traumatic glaucoma, always challenging, uh, aphakic glaucoma. Uh, so this is a pretty sick population of eyes coming in. They still had excellent IOP reduction uh, and no tysis. Um, getting back again to other options, uh, tube failure is something I encounter quite frequently. 
Uh, and in fact, when Joe Caprioli looked at his series of 156 Ahmeds, he found that, you know, you've heard the phrase a hypertensive phase. Well, it really should be called a hypertensive stage because uh, really it didn't occur. It occurred in 56% of the people who got an Ahmed, but it only resolved in 28%. So that's a lot of people stuck with a piece of hardware in their eye and a high pressure. Uh, then you have other options. Placing a tube shunt, two studies here, both done in the uh, around 2000, but um, they looked at revising the tube or placing a second tube. Uh, could be successful in maybe 40 to 50% of cases, but now the cornea starts going. And a quarter of patients needed to have a corneal transplant to deal with the corneal decompensation associated with the, the placement of a second tube shunt. You're seeing that now in the tube versus trabeculectomy study too. Five years out, persistent corneal edema is a most common side effect uh, in the, both the trab and the tube group, although it's higher in the tube group. Uh, well, what are your other options? So uh, this is a series of patients who had uh, cyclophotocoagulation after the tube placement and it failed and uh, they had a success rate in 71% of those eyes. And uh, yes, some of them needed a second step of transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, about a third of them. There were 7% uh, of patients lost light perception. Again, you've got a tube and it's failed. Uh, you've had a, a rough course of it. Um, so those risks are there, but there's efficacy there as well. And um, no need for corneal transplants and things like that in this group. Uh, and this has been shown to be a, a worthwhile approach as well in uh, pediatric glaucoma. These are pediatric eyes with a failed tube, uh, and they had about 62% success rate with uh, a second tube, 66%, so a little higher with transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Small numbers, but uh, again, um, used in, even in a pediatric population. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this tour, and I hope I haven't depressed you too much uh, talking about the challenges in refractory glaucoma treatment. It is a challenging venue. Um, I think my summary of, of everything here has been that, look, look, it's not always easy to treat these challenging glaucoma patients, uh, and we have to uh, be honest with our patients and honest with ourselves. Look at the data across a variety of options. Look at our patient. What course can this patient handle? Can they handle a sequence of surgeries? Is this someone uh, who doesn't even want to go to the operating room? Find the treatment that fits them based on the efficacy and uh, tolerability profile of that procedure uh, and move forward as best we can. But uh, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation is non-incisional, rarely contraindicated, repeatable, titratable, I think versatile um, and in that it does not preclude or cannot be precluded by any other procedure. Uh, and it's something where we're still learning a little bit about the ideal treatment paradigms, but the slow burn is where I'm at right now. I didn't talk about micropulse, uh, which is another future direction uh, that is probably going to be investigated with transcleral treatments. And uh, it's FDA approved for refractory glaucoma, uh, but um, deserves uh, further consideration of how its indications can be expanded and which patients would most appropriately benefit from its use. With that, I'll thank you very much.